today we're diving into a crucial topic that impacts the health and well-being of millions of South Africans. Medical aid schemes. Hello everyone and welcome back to FinEd, your favorite financial education channel. Before we begin, please don't forget to click that subscribe button and help us grow our community. Medical aids in South Africa have been around since before the 1980s, but it was during this decade that they became more organized. As people started to understand the advantages of being part of a medical aid scheme, their popularity increased rapidly. Early medical aid schemes were just hospital cash plans, not full coverage for medical expenses. By the 1990s, over 49,000 of these policies had been sold. The modern concept of medical aid started in the USA in the 1950s, covering major medical procedures. In South Africa, the first schemes were group covers, which individual membership options appearing later. By the early 1990s, several South African insurance companies were offering medical policies. The dreaded disease policy was introduced and added to life insurance policies. Today's medical aid is different from insurance. It covers daily medical expenses and hospital costs. This means individuals pay a monthly fee to the scheme, which then pays the healthcare providers according to agreed rates. Medical aids are regulated by the Medical Schemes Act number 131 of 1998, which protects consumers, medical professionals, service providers, and the schemes themselves. The Council for Medical Schemes established by this act oversees the regulation of private health financing through medical schemes. According to the act, a medical scheme's role is to take on liability in exchange for a premium. It provides access to relevant health services, helps cover medical expenses, and, if applicable, delivers health services through the scheme or designated providers as per an agreement with the scheme. The Act makes it clear that modern medical aid providers don't give cash payments to members when they are hospitalized. Instead, they take on the financial responsibility for the hospitalization costs on behalf of the member. Principle 1. Open Access Section 29.3 of the Act spells out the principle of open access. Medical aid schemes, except for restricted membership schemes, must accept anyone who applies. They cannot deny membership based on a person's health status or existing medical conditions. Restricted medical aid schemes can turn down membership applications only from people who don't meet their specific criteria. For example, if you're not an employee of a certain company, they can reject your application. However, anyone who fits their criteria must be accepted. Medical aid schemes use waiting periods and late joiner penalties to protect themselves against individuals considered high risk. These measures help manage risk and ensure fair membership. Principle 2. Community Rating This principle is introduced in Section 29.1, Subsection N of the Act. When people join a medical scheme, they all pay the same amount for a specific option. It doesn't matter how old they are, what their health is like, or any other factors. The only things that can affect the cost of their income or the number of dependents they have. This rule ensures fairness and prevents schemes from charging different amounts based on age, gender, health history, or how often someone uses health services. Principle 3. Minimum Benefits Section 29 of the Act also deals with minimum benefits. Medical aid schemes have to cover certain essential benefits for all members. 
These benefits are known as the Prescribed Minimum Benefits, or PMBs. Currently, there are almost 300 PMBs covering emergency medical aid conditions, certain other conditions, which, if left untreated, would seriously compromise a member's quality of life. And since the beginning of 2004, the diagnosis and treatment of 26 common chronic conditions. The prescribed minimum benefits PMB regulations include around 271 medical conditions, each accompanied by diagnosis treatment pairs. These pairs guide medical schemes on how to provide care for these conditions based on their diagnosis. When determining whether a condition qualifies as a PMB, doctors focus solely on the symptoms. They don't consider other factors, such as how the uh, injury or condition occurred. This approach is called diagnosis-based. Once the diagnosis is made, the doctor decides on the right treatment and care, including whether the patient should receive treatment in a hospital, as an outpatient, or at a doctor's office. The only time a medical aid scheme can cancel or suspend your membership or that of your dependents is one of the following. If you fail to pay your membership fee or your premium, you fail to pay any debt due to your medical scheme, you submit fraudulent claims, you commit any fraudulent act, or you fail to disclose material information. With the signing of the NHI Bill on 15 May 2024, what is going to happen to medical aid schemes and private healthcare facilities? Well, the NHI Act states that when the NHI is fully implemented, medical schemes will not be able to provide cover for services that are paid for by the NHI. In an article published by Discovery Health in May 2024, they strongly believe that limiting the role of medical schemes would be counterproductive to the NHI because there are simply insufficient resources to meet the needs of all South Africans. Limiting people from purchasing the medical scheme coverage they seek will seriously curtail the healthcare they expect and demand. It poses the risks of eroding sentiment and of denuding the country of critically needed skills and is impacting negatively on local and international investor sentiment and business confidence. The National Health Insurance Act doesn't mention how much the NHR will cost once it's fully implemented. But here's the scoop. Any major changes to healthcare delivery, especially if they involve working with private providers, will require significant additional funding. The government might consider using payroll taxes and extra income taxes to fund the NHI, but the National Treasury will ultimately make those decisions. And for now, there won't be any tax changes over the next three years, according to the Minister of Health when the Act was presented. As we wrap up, a South African who has medical aid is part of the very privileged few who can afford to use private healthcare while the rest of the population has to use our, pub our public healthcare services which are not at the very best level that they could be, except for maybe a very few handful. In fact, as of 2022, only 15.8% of all individuals in South Africa were members of a medical aid scheme, which represented a slight decrease from 16% recorded in the previous year. I hope that this video has been insightful and you have gained a bit of knowledge on medical aid schemes and medical aid. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to leave a thumbs up. So much for watching. Cheers guys and we'll see you in the next one.